So, um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm a little bit um, nervous about speaking when there is so much pressure in the NHS, things are so tough, and although we've made some improvements, I'm very conscious that uh, for all of us, this is a constant battle in the current environment, and one can never be complacent about any improvements that are made. So first of all, just a little bit about Northampton. Northampton is, is, is a town about an hour north of London. It, no, it isn't near either Nottingham or Northumbria. A lot of people really don't know where it is. Um, it's a rather faded industrial town which is currently being revitalised by um, a vibrant university which is actually moving just next to the hospital which is really great for us. Lots of building all around the town, masses of new houses mainly because they're excellent commuting links to get out of Northampton to go and work in Birmingham, Milton Keynes or London. Uh, also beautiful countryside with great villages and fantastic housing prices so anybody who's tempted to move <laughs> please come to us. Um, I think uh, when you talk about uh, improvement, the messages are really quite simple for us. And, and the theme that I hope will come through really is in, in three parts. The first one is about being honest and transparent and keeping to that no matter what. The second one is to encourage a belief that we really must always do our very best no matter what the circumstances, particularly in the context of patient safety. And the third one is fostering that belief that we can actually deliver fantastic care, but we can only do that that if we have a team approach as a hospital. So we're very much fostering the what we call Team NGH, Team Northampton General Hospital approach. And that means that everybody come, who comes to work for us, and they're all told this at induction, come to do two jobs. Uh, the first is to deliver care, and the second is to improve it. I feel particularly strongly about that. Um, in my clinical background, I realised very early on, you, you really can't do the best for the patient in front of you unless you think about the system in which you work. And that's more more obvious today than it has been at any other time. So, um, I think one of the reasons I was asked to speak was um, because of the results of our most recent CQC inspection. So this slide shows uh, four specialties inspected in 2014, January on the busiest day of the year. And again in 2017, or February, again we were on black alert when they came in to look at our A&E department. Um, and you can see really uh, quite a big change in the ratings, uh, a sea of orange to a sea of green was, was a pretty big achievement for us. The biggest improvements were in uh, the urgent emergency care pathway, which is one important barometer of a hospital, and in end-of-life care, which is another very important barometer. So without going into the detail of that, um, that was a, a really motivating thing for us, but perhaps more importantly were some of the words behind this. So what the team noticed in 2017 was a, a definite sense that the people who work for us now recognise our overall vision of best possible care pretty much uniformly and they also recognise that it can mean two things. It can mean best possible care in the whole world when you're the first trust to do some amazing new thing, which we have done once or twice, even though we are a small and unimportant hospital in many senses. And it can be best possible care when you're at 110% bed occupancy, you've got 80 medical outliers, all your day cases used for inpatients and things of that nature. They also recognise that the staff understood the values behind this. P very strong focus on patient safety came out. <laughs> very strong focus on aspiring to excellence, learning from error and respect and support for each other. So that was an important part of the narrative. Perhaps equally important was a change in the perception of the senior leadership team. So in 2017 people did recognise the senior leadership teams throughout the hospital and they also had confidence in their ability to lead. A big change. So the question question is why and how. So here we are. This is the front of our hospital. It doesn't exactly look like a modern hospital in the 20th century, and it isn't. Um, we still have wards in this part of the hospital. Uh, when you get inside, it does look a little bit more like a hospital, you'll be relieved to know. But uh, this does give us a few issues in terms of maintenance, particularly of the building. We have a very eclectic estate. It looks like asymmetric Lego planted on, an, uh, on a patch in the middle of Northampton. Um, we're exactly the kind of hospital that's going to run into a bit of trouble financially. 
Uh, we have a moderate turnover and a wide range of specialties, pitching a little bit above our weight in terms of running things like stroke, vascular services, renal services, and being a cancer centre. And we get nearly all our income from tariff. That means we have low reference costs, but we're running in deficit. We're managing, however, to keep the finances under control, to keep the quality measures good and stable or improving, and most of our performance targets are being met, although not all, especially not A&E. Um, so you might say this is an ordinary DGH replicated up and down the country with many of the problems that other people have. And uh, I just before we go on to talking about our story, want to remind us that despite this, in the NHS, in our hospital, in many hospitals, fantastic care is delivered every single day. I'm going to read a story that a patient sent in to me by email almost a year ago, and I've used it before to frame various meetings. Uh, quite an articulate patient, I have to say, and I couldn't have put this any better myself. And this is what she wrote. This is my first time as an inpatient. Feeling positive but slightly nervous about my stay, I arrived two weeks ago. I have been completely blown away by what I witness every day and every night and sometimes right through the night. Every single member of the team here, regardless of their job, role, position, perform many miracles and random acts of kindness with effortless grace. Young people, old people, black people, white people, very sick people, frightened people, emotional situations, disoriented people, blood, bodily fluids, the stench of bodily fluids, drugs, needles, drips, bedpans, commodes, bells, buzzers, alarms, hot patient days, restricted working spaces, long, long shifts, decisions, visitors, deadlines. I might be describing life in the trenches, but this is the daily ward life I have watched for the last two weeks. In the face of all this, I have observed humour, energy, patience, kindness, empathy, professionalism, knowledge, gutsiness, speed, efficiency, accommodating and flexible approach extended to every single patient, regardless of their situation. There are not enough positive adjectives in the dictionary to embellish the team. You have turned my experience into a joyful one, and for that I thank you all so much. And I'm reading that just to remind us that in every hospital every day, there's a lot of good things that go on, and although we need to improve, we really have to hold on to this because this is important for our staff. So I'm going to tell you about uh, the improvements we've made, paradoxically, by talking about the service which you might think has not changed. In 2014, urgent care was our biggest problem. It still is our biggest problem. It dominates the hospital in a way that it's not helpful, and yet our attitude to it and some of the care given it is profoundly different. If you walk into our ED department in 2017, and the CQC did this on the busiest day of the year, it feels calm and in order. The staff have a can-do attitude, and it feels entirely different from that same department three years ago, but we're still not meeting the target. So, we started with some honesty. Um, this was a slide which we used as a slight um, sort of cynical look at urgent care three years ago. And it came on the back of people saying urgent care it gets so much attention that all our wonderful specialties are getting forgotten. So the butterflies at the bottom are the wonderful specialties. The emperor of urgent care, I think the feeling was that we have plan after plan after plan and it's not getting there. So this is obviously an emperor with no clothes. So could we be honest about that? So we have the naked elephant on one side and the other form of the elephant is the elephant with his head in the sand saying it'll all be fine next winter don't you worry about it so what we said to people is that's how it's been we've got to make it different and then there was another bit of honesty, and this was about numbers. We had experienced a big rise in emergency admissions, and everybody told us we were just the same as everyone else, and we must stop externalising this problem. And this caused a real problem with the staff, who could see the increase in front of them. So we had some external analysis, and this slide, the big black line at the top is us, and, and the other lines are everybody else. And the point of the slide was just to, to say to people, actually, it's real. We have had a bigger increase. I never knew exactly why. I think it was something to do with taking on vascular stroke and the acute renal unit and everything that came with that, but it did give us a problem. But instead of saying, that's, that's it, that's the problem, we can't fix this, we took a different attitude, which was, this is not going to go away. Our job is to keep these patients safe. Our job is to approach this in a different way. So we're going to stop moaning about this. It is what it is. Let's get on with it. And that was the route in to ED. 
And what's happened in ED since has been a, a resolute focus on making things better. And there are a few things behind this. I think the first thing is you cannot change a department by instructing people to do things differently. The changes have got to come from the people on the ground. And they have to be involved in working out what works and what doesn't. And this was done through multiple tests of change. We used QI methodology, which we're using throughout the hospital, to support various tests of change, starting initially with patient safety. Because when we started, we'd had numerous serious incidents in the department. And people were almost feeling that this is just what was going to happen in a busy department. So that was the initial routine. Uh, but in the end, a whole bunch of programs were developed, all with patient safety at the center of them. Uh, the next thing was to really listen to the people on the ground in terms of what their issues were, but also make sure that they listened to senior management. So this was a partnership approach. It did involve quite a lot of challenge. It was not easy at the beginning. It was very much facilitated by a redesign of the emergency department around the team. So we kept our A&E going while we rebuilt it, basically. The team helped in the design. It's a pretty big challenge to do that while it's still in operation. But they've ended up with a fabulous recess area, a really good first assessment area, much better pediatric area, much better waiting areas generally, and an adjacent um, ambulatory care centre, all of which were designed by the team on the ground. That is so, so important. The other important thing goes back to that emperor elephant and that was what we used to talk to the rest of the hospital about their need to support ED. So we had to move from ED being an ED problem to being a whole hospital problem. We're still not fully there but it's much better than it was. If you walk through ED today, it doesn't matter whether you're a patient or a carer, uh, whether you're a senior manager or a regulator, you get a quite a positive vibe from it and I like going through ED. Three years ago I used to sort of slightly have to steal my myself to go and listen to all the moans. Now when I walk through, they cannot wait to tell me about their latest plan. Why is that? That's because of this consistent improvement work which comes from them. One of the things we've been doing in the hospital is focusing on health and well-being, and we have a really mad thing, which is uh, our version of Strictly Come Dancing. It's called Strictly NGH. Um, I, we started it three years ago, and I was brave enough to do it first time around, which means I never have to do it again, because you have to be a novice dancer. This year I was judging it, and I, out of the corner of my ear, I could hear two of our ED nurses talking to some relatives of some other competitors. And they were basically saying, we work in ED, it's fantastic, we're allowed to make the changes we need to do, it's the best department, we're going to be the best ED in the country. This was a healthcare assistant and a nurse manager, fantastic. And what they didn't then say is they were getting up at 4.30 the next morning to do a sponsored cycle ride for the department. So that kind of change is a, a massive change in terms of attitude, and I don't think it can come from anything else other than really listening to people on the ground. Um, I wish I could have bottled that particular conversation because it was very uplifting. So, so that's basically what we've tried to do there. Um, this is really important for me. So here we are failing the target still, uh, but leadership in ED was requires improvement and I think we were lucky to get that actually in 2014. Um, and it, we've now got outstanding for leadership in ED. So the question is why is that? Um, the two boxes at the bottom there, uh, one's called entitlement and one's called privilege. And I think this is one of the biggest issues in the NHS and it's certainly a big, big issue in our hospital. Um, we've got a lot of people in the NHS who are demoralised, who I think are stuck in this entitlement box. Uh, I see it particularly in doctors, I'm afraid to say. And the entitlement box says it's all very unfair. We have to work harder, our pay has been frozen, there's more pressure, we can't give the care we want to give, it's all terrible, I can't do anything about it, I'm just going to do my work and go home again. We don't get discretionary effort for those people, but we need to understand why they feel like that and help them to feel differently because people in the entitlement box are not happy. The privilege box, which is the right place to be, um, it's certainly how I feel about having been a doctor all my life, uh, says we have the best jobs in the world. We can make such a difference to people's lives. We can touch them at the most important moments of their lives. And we have the chance every single day to make that difference. Those people tend to put more effort in. They're always trying to make things better and they go home feeling happy. If you look at doctors, which I know well since I've been a doctor most of my life, I can absolutely tell you that the happiest doctors are the ones that work the hardest. So the 
question is, how do we make that change? What I've seen in ED is that change for the majority of staff. And people are therefore itching to get on with the next thing. So those same people that in 2014 were saying it's safe enough, of course we're going to have incidents. It's, it's not our fault, we're too busy. <coughs> now that the department are much better, are saying we're not safe enough. We've got more to do. We're going to take our next challenge on. What can we do next? Um, and I think that's our challenge but for the hospital generally is how to move people into that position and it's very hard because some of the things that result in that entitlement feeling do need to be dealt with we do need to think about the conditions in which people work so uh, this is just uh, what the ED department are doing at the moment. They're participating in, a, in an East Midlands programme, which is about uh, safety. Um, we're doing it in ED and in maternity. And I put this up because this was the baseline survey uh, to start us off. So the baseline survey, our hospital is uh, the blue scores box, and, and we are at the top of the range for every single question. Uh, so there was a moment of self-congratulation that went on then, but that was immediately translated into which of these scores are not where we need to be and what are we going to do about it and they're actively really trying to take this further and also working with other trusts and helping them. So a completely different attitude spurred on really by success breeding success. Uh, this is basically what we're trying to do in the rest of the hospital. So we, we started off, um, uh, when I took over in 2013, I, I often tell people that, that I'd worked with six chief execs and eight directors of HR, and it could go on a bit like that. We'd had a lot of instability in the exec team at that time, and we had a lot of what I would call silo working across the hospital and also with the exec portfolio. So people were looking after their own areas but not really seeing it as a team effort. So what we've worked on really hard is to try and say quality particularly is everybody's responsibility. Finance is not a blocker, it's an enabler. We are using quality improvement as our unifying principle. If we try to make things better from a QI point of view, the finances will follow. And in fact, our financial control has been much better since we adopted that approach. It's all about looking at things that are bad, like the staff survey at that time, and I'll come on to that right at the end, and saying we're not going to do an action plan for this. We're going to say, what is this staff survey telling us about the way the hospital works? What are we going to do differently? How are we going to develop our staff? The development of staff is mainly around QI methodology with the leadership and, and softer things wrapped around that. Um, and we also uh, converted from a mainly managerially led organisation to a clinically led organisation. This is work in progress. It's tough to do this and it requires a consistent approach time after time. There's a little word in there which is the word called excellence. I'm just going to talk about that for a minute because quite often in a district general hospital people have got the idea of we're a bog standard hospital, we can't be excellent. We're not a tertiary centre, we're not a national centre of excellence so how can we do the things we would like to do in these times? And the answer is that you can and that nobody comes to work to do an ordinary job. People are not motivated by mediocrity, they're motivated by excellence. And I'm taken back to a conversation I had with a patient some time ago, it was a very interesting patient who'd been battling leukemia for about 10 years and was dying and I asked him if it had all been worth it and he said two things that were very humbling the first thing was that his 10 years living with leukemia had been the best 10 years of his life and the reason for that was it, he felt it had connected him to what mattered in life and to his family and to humanity in general and the next thing was about care at Northampton General and he said I just want you to know that the care delivered at this hospital knocks the spots off any care I've received in any of the big important hospitals. So I said, but why? And he said, because when I'm treated here, I'm always made to feel like I'm the only patient that matters by the staff who are treating me, and I'm always given access to the right care quickly because of the system set up. So that shows you, even in an ordinary hospital, if you're focusing on the right things, you can deliver excellence. That is excellence. As a patient, the most important thing is that your doctors and nurses treat you in that sort of a way. And so that feeling of really a aspiring to be the best has to run through all of that in the various things we're, be, we're doing. 
Now, quality improvement um, is our unifying aim. We have actually been working at this for quite a long time, and um, I've put up there three programs of work with the word excellence in. The, the first thing we started was called Aspiring to Excellence, and that is still one of our core values. That was the name we gave to a three-week course for medical students on patient safety. And I can tell you, if you offer people the choice between a three-week course entitled Patient Safety and a three-week course entitled Aspiring to Excellence, you get a very different response. <laughs> And actually, what we asked these students to do in these courses was to take a good, hard look at something really important in the hospital and tell us how bad it was, and then take a really good look at what we needed to do to make it better and present it to the trust board. We started that back in 2009. Um, this was a really successful program, and on the back of that, we now have a senior lecturer in quality improvement that does the, the modules for Leicester University. Delivering excellence, uh, achieving excellence, rather, was um, the program we designed for our registry and we gave them the task of leadership training. Again, rather than calling it the leadership and management training for registrars, it was called Achieving Excellence, and the leadership and management training was wrapped around it, and they were tasked which to, with actually delivering some of these ideas that the medical students came up with. And we've had great fun with that. They all took on quite impossible things in some cases, thinking they could solve the world, and it gave them a lot of interaction with senior consultants and management, which they really enjoyed. Our latest one is called Pathway to Excellence, uh, and that's about achieving really good standards for nursing. Um, our director of nursing is uh, using an American model for this. We hope to be the first UK trust to be accredited in this scheme. And it's again really upping the ante and saying we don't want our nursing care to be mediocre or meet mandatory standards. We want it to be the best it can be. This really helps in terms of inspiring people. Up on, on the slide is just uh, to remind me to tell you about is our, our quality improvement update nurse, uh, newsletter. And this particular one is, is telling everyone about the MSC and quality improvement and safety that we're running with the University of Northampton. The, these kinds of programs bring us into contact with universities, with people nationally and internationally. They give us lots and lots of opportunities to share good practice and also learn from others, but particularly perhaps to motivate people. And this is just a list for the last year of posters and things presented all over the place. So we had 12 at the National Conference last week, which was the biggest um, uh, sort of uh, from the UK. We had 25 in Gothenburg last year. We support our medical students, our junior doctors and others to go to these, increasingly spreading it through the hospital. We feel very strongly that we need to support our doctors in training because uh, institutions that train well also deliver better care and we're trying to make this as multidisciplinary as possible. Uh, I, I think this, this is starting to take hold now much more than it did in the past. It's taken quite a lot of effort to get it to this point, but it's really just to say this actually fires people up. When you, when you have the opportunity to stand up and present your work and be proud of it, it is actually motivating both for the people presenting and for their sponsors who are the consultants. So in terms of some hard things, our quality indicators are doing all right. Some of them are getting definitely better. This is just mortality, which was up and down for a while and has been consistently much better. All our other quality indicators are improving. And I'm just going to end with a staff survey. This is a real problem for us. Uh, this graph shows the red things are bad things. So the bottom 20%, uh, if you're in the bottom 20%, that's the red bar. And you can see 2012, it's in the middle of there. We had nearly everything in the bottom 20%. Uh, we had nothing which was green and in the top 20%, and we had a bit in the middle. Every year since then, it has got better. Um, this year, we've, we've got uh, some scores in the top 20%, particularly staff motivation at work, significant improvement in nearly everything in the yellow box, um, which is, again, a big change, and we're in the top five most improved acute trust. This is still very much work in progress. We're not where we need to be with it, but it's a whole heap better than it was when we started. What that tells us, I think, is that the strategy is the right strategy. It's starting to pay dividends. If you walk around the hospital and speak to people, I think people will say it feels a better place to work. Uh, there's more fun in the workplace. There's more camaraderie. There's more of a team NGH approach. But I'm very conscious that these things are fragile. This is not a finished story. I think what people feel 
deal now is they believe that they can move from requires improvement to good. They still have in their sights becoming outstanding one day. Um, and they can feel that it's not as impossible as they once thought it was. So thank you to listening for Tales from Northampton. Uh, it's an ordinary hospital where amazing things happen every day, which is, I'm sure, the same for many of you. So thank you. Um, we have time for just a couple of questions. So if anyone has a question they'd like to put to Sonia, would you please raise your hand and someone will come to you quickly with a roving mic. And while people are thinking, I'll ask, you, ask you one. We've got a number of people, in, uh, non-executives, chief execs, other board members here. If there was one thing you would say, um, if they were on the train home, going to send an email to their colleagues to say, this is something we, we should think about doing, what, what would you suggest is, not the silver bullet, but one thing that's really had an impact? I, I think it's developing people to uh, understand and deliver quality improvement and having that as a consistent message throughout the hospital. Uh, so moving away from saying we'll send you away on random leadership programs and things like that, but saying no, actually, you come to work to do a good job, we're going to help you do that job better and help improve things and it will be on-site training with teams supporting you. I think that's that's the single most important thing. Thank you. Do we have another question? We have a question number one over there. Just picking up a little bit on what you've just said, so um, have you tried to um, train all of your workforce in QI? Do you have a, like a QI training programme for everybody? Uh, we have um, a number of different ways of doing it. We have something called Making Quality Count, uh, which is a small, t a small but perfectly formed team who work with whole departments um, to help them understand how to analyse the problem and do service improvement in that sort of way. We also have a quality improvement team largely based on safety issues which have been in place for some time which will do the same thing. Not every single person is training but gradually we're rolling the training out. People compete to be part of the programmes to get the development and support and then we're gradually increasing the spread of that. But the aim is obviously to to get as many people trained as possible. And we're just going to take one more question for time. We've, we've got a question here. Thank you. Just, just following on from that, I, I wonder if you could say a bit more about how you think we can break down the professional silos that often act as a barrier to, to kind of real quality improvement. Um, and you talked about honesty I, uh, and honest conversations. I wondered if that, that was a way of, or an opportunity to, to help people to break down those barriers. I, th I think if you get your quality improvement projects right, that flows out of it quite nicely. I mean, we've had some very interesting projects led by, for example, admin staff. Um, so one of our best improvement projects was in the fracture clinic, and it was led by the admin staff who got actually more or less beat the consultant orthopaedic surgeons into submission in terms of changing processes. That was really effective, actually, in uh, uh, creating mutual respect between various groups of people. Um, I think if you get your projects right and your support right, some of that flows out of it quite nicely. But I agree, it's an ongoing problem. I mean, in the ED department, we've definitely succeeded in that. I mean, if you talk to a healthcare assistant in ED, I met one the other day, and I said, do you like work? How long have you been working here? She said, it's fantastic. It's much better than the other department I was in, which I won't name. I'm allowed to talk to anybody. I'm allowed to give my opinion to anyone. I really matter. And that is the result of that kind of improvement work, basically. Thank you. Now, I saw a couple of other hands up. I'm, Sonia will be around for a while longer. Um, please feel free to, to speak to her in, in the break to ask any of those questions. But one more time, please thank uh, Sonia for sharing with us. Thank you.